would stand with me for the reading of God's word. Acts 2, 42 um, to the 47th verse. And it reads, the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the community or fellowship, to their shared meals or the breaking of bread, and to their prayers. A sense of awe came over everyone. God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. All the believers were united and shared everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They praised God and demonstrated God's goodness to everyone. The Lord added daily to the community to those who were being saved. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let's pray. Most gracious and heavenly Father God, we are grateful for an opportunity to come to you just as we are, to come to you as a body. And we pray God during our time over the next few minutes in your word that you would reveal yourself to us in life-changing ways. I pray, God, that you would uh, give me concision of speech and clarity of thought and conviction of heart that you would hide me behind your cross so that it is not I, but it is you, uh, that it is your word that is held up high so that our lives can be transformed and we can be made more into the image of your son. Let the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. 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 Uh, and so we're jumping back in from last week. We've been walking through, I should probably say, I am Pastor Jennifer. I'm one of the pastors that serves here. And I just want to thank Pastor Ben for an opportunity uh, he gives of this time, of this space freely. Um, and so I, I'm honored to be able to stand before you guys and just spend some time in the word. And so we're coming back from a couple of weeks ago. We were talking about the Pentecost and the Holy Spirit coming and how it drove the church forward. It was the engine for the church that moved it forward. We talked a little bit last week about uh, what it meant to look at Acts in light of our mission statement, to be a people on mission. The first part of our mission statement, to be a people on mission. We looked at how the, the Pentecost propelled the church forward and how a diverse multi-ethnic people get, began to go on mission. I asked, what is our mission statement? Some of us got it, some of us had to think about it. Um, and I said, how do we live out our mission here at Christ Church? How are we living out being a people on mission? I asked, what are we willing to pay to reach the lost? What are we willing to pay? I reminded us that it's gonna cost us something. Uh, it cost us our comfort. Sometimes it cost us a realigning of our budget. What are we willing to, cost, to pay to reach the gospel? And I challenged us, if our bubbles are a Christian bubble, we needed to pop the bubble because God was drawing people to himself. Uh, so what were we willing to pay to be a people on mission? And again, as a reminder, we are a people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. That's why we exist. That's why we believe we are here. Uh, we are people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. And so for the next few minutes, I just want us to look at what it means on the second part of our mission statement, to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. Look at your neighbor and say, to bring hope and wholeness. Give you a chance to wake up. Look at your other neighbor and say, through Christ. Very good, very good. Give yourself a pat on the back. Um, and so last week we looked at that and we went kind of fast. Quite a few of you told me I was up here sweating like a Baptist preacher. I almost went back there and asked Trey for his handkerchief out of his pocket because I was sweating. So today we're gonna slow down and we're just gonna go verse by verse and we're gonna look at what the word of God has to say to us. So uh, in our first, the first thing I wanna say to us is that when we are a people bringing hope and wholeness through Christ, the scripture shows us today that it is not complicated. If we are a people bringing hope and wholeness through Christ, it is not complicated. The scripture says the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings, to the community, to their shared meals, and to their prayers. The early church was a people on mission 
to go ye therefore, baptizing all nations in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and teaching everything that God had commanded. And while they did this, they expressed a very simple faith. The earliest account of Christianity comes from a pagan Roman governor named Pliny the Younger. And he is writing to an emperor named Trajan. And this is what he says about the early church. He's interrogating them because they're trying to figure out what's going on. They're worshiping a guy that said, you got to eat my body. And then all of a sudden he went into a tomb and then all of a sudden he disappeared. So they're trying to figure out what is going on. And he says about the early church. They asserted, however, that the sum and substance of their fault or error had been that they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsibly a hymn to Christ as to God, amen, and to bind themselves by oath not to some crime, not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, nor falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return to a trust when called upon. When this was over, it was their custom to depart and to assemble again to partake of food, ordinary, innocent food. This is what the, the, the understanding of the early church was. It was very simple. Uh, I, I often wonder, when we look back many, many, many years from now, generations from now, what will be said about the church in 2023? What will be said about Christ Church Nashville? In tw looking back in 2023, what will be said about us? Will we be known as one who practiced simple faith empowered by the Holy Spirit? I really do believe we have complicated simple church. We have complicated it. They brought hope and wholeness by being very, very simple. The, these are four things that they did. There were, there was an, uh, the Holy Spirit was the engine, but there were four wheels. So if imagine, imagine if the church was a car, the Holy Spirit is the engine and there's four wheels. This is what they did. First, they practiced and they read the apostles' teachings. This is simply the truth that Jesus gave to the disciples that was passed down. We believe it's inspired by the Holy Spirit that it's inerrant. This wasn't a commandment for them to do it. It was simply what they did, who they were. As pastors, as a pastor, I have spent a lot of time begging people to read the word of God. The early church did not have to do that. It was a simple faith. And because God had done something incredible for them, the outflow of that is that they wanted to read his word. They dedicated themselves to the apostles' teachings. A few years ago, I had somebody tell me, you know, I, I, I can read the Bible, mainly just the red letters. I don't know if I need all the rest of that. Somebody said that to me. I said, Holy Spirit, come and fill this place. And so I said, listen to it this way. Imagine that someone that you love with your whole heart, someone that you love with your whole heart has gone away. We can say to battle, we can say wherever, but they've gone away. But they left you 66 letters. They've written you 66 letters. Now you say that you love them with your whole heart. Let's just assume that they saved your life one day when you were walking down on Broadway, right? So they saved your, day, your life. They wrote you 66 love letters. Is it really love if you leave it on the shelf and let it get dusty? Are those love letters, is it really love if you let those love letters sit on your coffee table and hold your coffee mug? Is it really love if it's on your manner of eyeness and you never open it up? If we love God, if God has transformed our lives, if he has saved us and filled us with his Holy Spirit, the outflow of that is that we are going to be dedicated to the apostles' teachings, just like the early church, amen? Now let's say that's the front left tire. So the for the front right. The next was the community or the fellowship. The word here is uh, koin koinonia, which is a kind of intimate fellowship that you find in a marriage. It's a fellowship with a purpose. It's not simply enjoying each other's company over coffee, but it is a shared commitment to an important task, the task of loving each other sacrificially. I know that COVID has shifted the sands of the, just sands of our feet. 
I understand that the world has shifted in many, many ways and we're disconnected, but we have got to figure out like the early church, how to be connected to community in a real tangible way. The early church made this a priority and we have to as well. Quite a few of us live our lives without ever connecting with other believers throughout the week. That was not what the early church did. That was not simple church. Because they loved God, because he had saved them, there were things that they were committed to and the outflow was that they wanted to be with God's people. You wanna know why? Because they were under persecution. And so when people come in, when the world comes in and tries to tell us that we can't, what happens is it binds us together. So in many ways, the church in America is at a disadvantage because we don't know what it's like to be persecuted for our faith because there is something that binds us together when we are. The, the next will is that they had shared meals. It says the breaking of bread. This is something that unites us. Scott did a beautiful job at the table today. This is something that brings us together. This, this means that they took the Lord's Supper together, that they had that, but there was also shared meals. There was also an opportunity to come together. Our own online family has it right because the text seems to indicate that a lot of this sharing of meals was in the context of their own home not necessarily just in the context of temple worship. And then the last will is that they had prayer. Jesus says that, and my house shall be called the house of prayer. They dedicated themselves to this. They were committed to this. And I truly believe that if we want to see God move in our lives, we simply need to take him at his word. And so if we would pray, if we would be a people who prays, then we would see, just like the early church, incredible things happening. So the four things that they focused on was the apostles' teachings, very simple, community, fellowship, the breaking of bread, sharing a meal, and they focused on prayer. One of the really awesome things that's happening in the life of our church is we have a men's prayer group that meets every Saturday. So if you don't know how to pray, if you would gather with our brother Howie, he will help you. He will show you how to pray. We also have a powerful, when I say powerhouse, a group of women who gather. They have been gathering on Tuesdays online. Now they are back on campus on Mondays, a couple of Mondays a month, but they walk every inch of this campus. They've been in the choir loft. They came for Windshape and just walked the halls before Windshape to cover the building in prayer. We are a church that's committed to prayer. And if you're looking for ways to do that, we have incredible tangible ways to do that. And Pastor Jackie leads that ministry so faithfully. We also, every Wednesday, first Wednesday of the month, we have a prayer, a night of prayer and worship. So you get to pray and worship, right? So you have multiple things going on in the life of the church. There's this idea out there that simple church is three things. So if you want to be a successful church in America, then they say that you should do three things. Sunday morning worship, small groups, and kids ministry. So if you are not into Sunday morning worship, or if you're not into small groups, or if you are not into kids ministry, you don't fit into the modern church of what's successful. I got news for you. Christ Church is not necessarily a simple church. We have quite a few things going on in the life of the church because we are a multi-generational church with people coming from all different walks of life. So what does it mean for us to practice the simple practices of faith? We can look at this. Uh, bringing hope and wholeness through Christ is not complicated. Verse 43 says, a sense of awe came over everyone and God performed many wonders and signs through the apostles. Before there was ever the miraculous, there was the mundane. Before there was ever the miraculous, there was the mundane. Oftentimes we wanna see God do something spectacular, but we don't wanna read his word. We wanna see God heal people when they come to the altar from cancer, but we don't wanna pray. We wanna see God uh, bring about miraculous manifestations in our life with resources and finances, but we don't wanna gather with other people. So before anything miraculous can happen, the mundane has to happen. The mundane, the practices of everyday life. Uh, the second thing I want you to remember is bringing hope and wholeness through Christ requires that we sacrifice for each other. We have to be willing to sacrifice. First, first 44 says, all the believers were united and shared everything. Somebody underlined in their Bible, everything. They would sell pieces of property and possessions and distribute the proceeds to everyone who needed them. Now, scripture has a way of ste stepping on our toes. I tell people often, if you can't say amen, say ouch. If you can't say amen, I thought about getting that as a shirt, but Shelby, can you help me? If you can't say amen, say ouch. Scripture has a way of stepping on our toes. Some people want to put this in a box because it makes them uncomfortable. And so what do they call this? Socialism. 
right? So they don't have to do this. This is socialism. We don't have to do that. But this is not government sanctioned need meeting. This is gospel sanctioned need meeting. This is from heaven. This is God recalling this, causing this of his church, of his people. This is something that the church does. So it is not socialism. You want to know why this has turned into a political volleyball? You want to know why this has turned into a political volleyball? Because the church has abdicated its responsibility to do the very thing that God has called us to do. Pastor Ben said it earlier, God has called us to care for the orphan, the sojourner, the widow, and the oppressed. When was the last time that you personally cared for an orphan? When was the last time that you personally cared for a sojourner? When was the last time that you personally cared for the poor? I'm not talking about giving a donation to Red Cross. I'm talking about the church of Jesus Christ saying, this is what we are called to do. This is who we are called to be. It was simple church. They were willing to sacrifice for each other. We become more like Ananias and Sapphira than we have like Paul and Peter. We want to give some and then hold back a good bit and let people see the good that we're doing. But we have to be just like the early church. According to Barna, who has did a deep dive study, it's a Christian research company, they've done a deep dive study of Nashville. Citizens in Nashville said that the two issues that the church should be most focused on should be the care for the homeless, and taking care of those who are in poverty and who are hungry. If the church is doing anything other than those two things, the citizens of Nashville say, we don't know why you're here. Now, for sure, we need to be here to grow disciples and to affirm disciples, but the church focused on something very simple, very sacrificial, and God brought the growth. God brought the growth. Uh, The the perfect picture of this is when Jesus himself, he's traveling along the city of Capernaum and a rich young man comes to him and says, Jesus, I've done all the things you have commanded, but what am I missing? And God told him, don't commit murder. Don't commit adultery. I think most of us, if we can check those off, you can check them off in your head. Don't steal. Don't give false testimony, which I'm struggling with Lucas on these days. Don't give false testimony. Honor your mother and father also and love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said, I have done all these. What am I still missing? And Jesus said, uh, he said, if you want to be with me, you need to do what I say. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor. Then you you will receive a treasure in heaven. And Jesus said, then you can come follow me. So there were some prerequisites to what the rich man had to do in order to follow Jesus. He had to be willing to sacrifice for others. Many of us are unwilling to do that. The disciples are, when they hear this, they're shocked. They're like, what do you want us to, if they, if, who can be saved? And Jesus says, through God, all things are possible. He says, don't be distressed that their reward is in, in eternity and it will be much greater than anything that they have here on earth. All who have houses, brothers, sisters, fathers, mothers, children, or farms because of my name will receive 100 times more and will inherit eternal life. Many will see that the first will be last and many who are last will be first. Because they were willing to sacrifice because they knew that their reward was in heaven. Guys, if you can touch it, it's corruptible and it will pass away. But if we are willing to give these things that are corruptible, God will bring the increase to us. Uh, The third thing I want you to remember is that to bring hope and wholeness through Christ, we need each other. To bring hope and wholeness through Christ, we need each other. It says, every day they met together in the temple and ate in their homes. They shared food with gladness and simplicity. They didn't just meet together in large gatherings for worship. They also had small group meetings in their homes and eating together was a key part of that because sharing a meal creates a bond. It makes us move towards reconciliation and it helps us to anticipate the heavenly banquet when we get to eat and drink with Jesus. The recent popularity of small groups, it isn't new. It's a return to the early church. If there isn't vibrancy in our churches today, maybe it's because we've forgotten the necessity of eating together, of being together in our homes. What does the text say? It didn't say they did this one time a week. It said they did this every day. They gathered at the religious meeting places and then they went and gathered in their homes. I remember growing up, if you, if you got lucky, the pastor would come to your house after church. What I didn't like about it is the pastor would get the best piece of chicken. Mama would get him the collard greens and the turnip greens. And I'm just looking like, well, what my candy yams? 
right? And so there was a time when the, the community used to gather even outside of the fellowship of worship. That was super important to what was happening in the life of the church. When was the last time that we welcomed somebody in this faith family into our home for a meal? If you can't say amen, say ouch. When was the last time that you were welcomed into someone's home in this faith body? Again, Barna says to us about Nashville, 80% of Gen Z, 65% of millennials, this is in Nashville, 47% of Gen X, and 37% of boomers are experiencing significant levels of loneliness and disconnection in Nashville. Greater than the national average, y'all. Our city is not well. People are looking for a way to be connected. If you have been in Nashville under two years, those numbers are astronomically higher than that. They kept it very simple. They realized that they needed each other in the early church. A picture for this is recently I heard a very cool story. We have uh, two members in our churches. Their names are Dr. Jory and Janine Simmons. And so they have a small little group of folks who gather from all walks of life, as I understand it. People from all over our church are gathering. And now they are at this point where there are so many people gathering in their homes that they don't have room. It's spilling over. They have opened their homes to people in this church and now it is multiplying to where we, we probably need more homes to help make room for all those that are gathering with them. This is a real opportunity to do this. Yesterday I had an incredible opportunity to go to uh, Sanitha and John's house. They are members of our congregation and they uh, just bought a home in Spring Hill, uh, Tennessee and they asked me to come and bless their home. Now, I ate the best Indian food that I have eaten in my whole life. I paid for it later, but I ate heartburn. It felt like fire. Shut up in my Jonah was talking about heartburn. But it was incredible. There was a time of worship and there was a time of prayer and there was such a, such a time of honor to share with a culture that I don't really understand. It may be a little uncomfortable, but that's, but that's what the early church did. They found out a way to live together. They realized that they needed each other. And the last point is, if we are people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ, we will produce fruit. We will produce fruit. Remember last week after the gospel was preached, repentance happened and people believed and were baptized. And today what we see is a continuing movement of the church forward. Because the early church in chapter two kept the main thing, the main thing. They were committed to knowing God's teachings and they were committed to being together in fellowship and community. They shared meals together in their homes and they prayed together faithfully and they cared for each other's needs. This is simple church. This is all that God has called us to. And God brought the growth. It says not just, uh, not just a few people were added. This wasn't sheep swapping. They didn't leave one church and come to another. People were being saved who did not hear the gospel, who did not know the gospel. Everyone sitting in these pews knows someone who could use Jesus' peace. If you don't, pop your bubble. Everyone in here knows someone who could use hope and eternal life that Christ can bring. It says many were, served, were saved that day because they were focused on the mission to make disciples. They practiced a simple faith. They didn't get caught up in the programs. They didn't get caught up in the buildings and they didn't get caught up in the dollars, amen? They were focused on the main thing. Many were saved because the early church was focused. I believe that God's word is true. Anybody else? I believe that God's word is true. And I don't care what the world tells us, his word does not change. His word does not change. If it worked for Peter, Paul, and John, if it worked for Priscilla, Julia, and Abigail, if it worked for Luke and Silas and Barnabas and Junia and Philip and Phoebe, it works for us, amen? God's word is still true. His word also does not return to him void. So I want us to focus on the commission, the great commission, keeping the main thing the main thing. If we would focus on these simple practices, I truly believe we could live into our mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ, amen? It says that we're going to be known by our love. If we do this, if we are faithful in our care for each other and we don't grow weary in good doing, I earnestly believe that God has a harvest out there for us to reap, amen? If we are people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ, we will produce fruit. So what? What do we do with this? The, the old pastor was saying, I'm about to close. What do we do with this? There is so much life happening here at this church, and I'm excited about what God wants to do. Now, this life might look a little bit different than it has in the past. 
that's okay. It might not look like Bible studies in every classroom in this building. That's okay. It may not look like hundreds of kids on this campus overtaking the campus. That's okay. It might not look like hymn singings or a Hillsong inspired stadium concert. That's okay. It may look really, really simple, y'all, but I believe that if we do this, we will see some of the same things that the early church saw. It may look more like growing our care for mental health and grief and divorce support groups. It may look like more meals happening in everybody's homes that are not on this campus. It may look like us not fighting old hickory traffic to get here. It may be us and our communities reaching out and it may mean that we have to restructure how we do ministry in order to live into our mission. And so for the next three months, I just, for the next couple of months this summer, I wanna challenge us. So, so just here and we'll close. Uh, I, wanna, I want us to recommit or commit anew to seek God's word. Can you do that? To read God, I'm not gonna beg you to read the Bible, but to, uh, the outflow of who we are, to read God's word, to bring hope and wholeness through Christ to our faith community, we need to fellowship with each other. Now, I know some of y'all will tell me, well, Pastor Jen, I'm an introvert. Well, Holy Spirit, help. Get out. See if there's a way for you to fellowship, for you to connect. Um, you know, I live a little far out. So this is not written down, but I live a little far out. And there was a young lady who came to our church. Her name is Selena. And she came uh, as a fifth graduate valedictorian just recently. So very good. I take no credit for that. And one day she just came up to me and it was my fault. Pastor Jen failed, y'all. I'm telling y'all the truth, I failed. She came up to me and she said, can I just come and be with your family? Can I just watch you? Can I just be, a, you know, and she came up to me and I said, yes, I should have asked you over for dinner. And so she came and she's a part of our family. And I know that was uncomfortable for her. And I know I probably should have met her halfway, but sometimes that's what we have to do in order to be in fellowship. So would you reach out? Would you find someone in the congregation and say, would you like to have dinner? Just this summer. And if you're uncomfortable with doing that, we have the dinner of eight that will make that possible. You can connect to a dinner of eight group and be able to do that in a more intentional way. Would you consider sharing a meal with someone you don't know? I know many of us are already doing this, but would you be willing to do it with someone you do not know? And then would you invite people into your home th safely? People into your home to meet and gather. And then finally, would you commit to praying like we have never prayed before? If there are opportunities to pray communally, will you connect with that? I believe that if we do these things, we will see God do the miraculous just like he did for the early church. God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And so I do believe that he has a plan for us. Would you pray with me? Amen. Most gracious and heavenly Father, God, we are so grateful for you and we are so grateful for your word. We pray, God, that you would help us uh, to be a people on mission, to bring hope and wholeness through Christ in incredibly intentional ways, God, whether that be to go to the mission uh, at Mountain Brook and serve faithfully, or, or whether that would be to join and gather with others as we share meals, or to pray, or to read your word. Uh, God, would you give us the focus? Would you give us the ability to keep the main thing the main thing? We pray, God, that your spirit would move uh, in Christ Church Nashville in real and tangible ways, and each person that sits here real tangible ways and that you would help us to connect to our community in a way that brings hope and wholeness and transforms the world, God. We believe and we trust. And if there are those under the sound of my voice who do not know you, who do not have a relationship with you, God, I pray that you would convict their hearts and that you would bring them into the saving knowledge of who you are, God, so they can enter into mission with us, Lord. We love you. We adore you. We are so grateful for your son, Jesus. It is because of him we have access to eternal life. It is because of him we have access to hope. Uh, we have access to ho wholeness and we can carry that to others through him. We love you, we adore you, and we ask this in his name, amen, amen. Would you stand with me? May God keep you and may he bless you as you go out and you be a people on mission to bring hope and wholeness through Christ. Thank you.